Good morning, everybody. It is Friday, October 23rd, 2020. I always pause a little bit there because I actually look at the calendar and make sure that I get it right. Uh, Kirk Spano, fundamentaltrends.com, Seeking Alpha, Margin of Safety Investing, Investing 2020s on YouTube. This is my investment firm, Blue Mount Asset Management. And you can find me yelling at people on Twitter right there. So we will do our quick coronavirus run through. Last night was the uh, last presidential debate. And I would venture a guess that is the pre last presidential debate for both guys, because I don't see Joe Biden running a second time. Um, and of course, if Trump wins, I don't think he's going to get it through the Congress to change the Constitution to let him stay. So there you go. Last time that you have to hear Donald Trump lie to you in a debate or Joe Biden stumble through his answers. What do we know? Well, this is the chart I've had up since April. Cascading economic destruction with the second wave in the fall causing big, big problems, which we're about to see. Lingering economic weakness in 2021 with the potential for stagflation. Although I think we're gonna see a two piece economy where certain things are deflationary and other things are inflationary. Hence the barbell approach to investing that we have covered and the economy starts to recover in earnest in 2022. What do we know? The second wave of coronavirus is clearly upon us as infections, hospitalizations and deaths are rising again. Uh, the lack of support for masks and social dis distancing by about a third of the population is what is keeping the economy down. Anybody who doesn't know that by now, hasn't figured it out by now, uh, doesn't want to. This is from the CDC. As you can see over here, deaths have been relatively level and have ticked up in the last week. Um, I am quite afraid that deaths are going to keep ticking up in coming weeks. Uh, here in Wisconsin, one of our um, field hospitals, you know, the hospitals that they popped up in, in stadiums and parking lots and things, uh, we have one out by our state fair, which is a little bit west of Milwaukee in a suburb called West Dallas. It's, it's a very urban suburb. It's, it's attached to Milwaukee. It's very urban. Um, we had our first patient in the auxiliary hospital uh, yesterday. So we have overflow happening in many of the COVID units in the greater Milwaukee area now, um, particularly since folks in Waukesha County who are one of the hotspots uh, because Republican County, they don't wanna wear masks. I, as I told you about this last week, went to a bowling alley out there, 400 people all turned and looked at me as I walked in with a mask. None of them had masks on except for the staff and they were shoulder to shoulder. So, you know, there, there's hot spots. It's ideologically driven. It's silly. Um, we should all be wearing masks. I, I don't know how much more I have to pound on that. But the death rate is now going up. And because there's fewer hospitals in Waukesha County where I live, uh, a lot of those folks end up in Milwaukee hospitals. And we're starting to have overflow in our COVID units. And I know that's going on in other parts of the country as well. So we keep looking at this from MIT because it's the quickest adjusting uh, forecaster using artificial intelligence. And now where this was starting to bend over a few weeks ago, now they're projecting it to rise again. And you are very possibly going to be having 1500 deaths a week um, come November. We can see down here that the reproduction rate is well over one. We need it down here you know, when we close the economy short term, if we had come out of this all heavy duty wearing masks, uh, we probably would have done pretty well. And in fact, there is actually a projection for that that was done way back in April and May. So this isn't something that's hindsight driven. This is what they were hoping would happen. And they projected out about 100,000 deaths uh, versus the 200,000 that we got. This is MIT. Again, you know, these are not just, you know, people throwing darts at a board. So we've really done it to ourselves. Uh, the economy is weak because we have not controlled coronavirus. There are virtually no shutdowns right now, right? And, and there are lawsuits that even fight the 50% uh, 
um, uh, capacity uh, ideas for bars and restaurants. So in Wisconsin, the Tavern League and the Republican legislature are fighting the idea that we need to limit the people in bars and restaurants to half of their capacity. And, and I get why a business owner would be concerned um, or why an alcoholic would need to go to the bar. However, uh, I would say this, given that we gave $3 trillion to big business and we're still doing it, and I'll show you that at the end, um, it wouldn't take much to write a check to every bar and restaurant owner in America and say, hey, this is one twelfth of your revenue from last year. Revenue, revenue, not even profit. One twelfth of your revenue for one month. Close for a month, deep clean the place, pay your people. We could do it. It only costs a few hundred billion dollars, but hey, small business isn't worth it. So why is the economy so weak? We're just gonna focus on unemployment. The number that you're getting on CNBC is that unemployment is down to 5.7 or 5.8% or something along that, that lines. Bullshit. Once again, we'll go to the farmer lingo bullshit. We have over 22 million people on continuing claims. When you include PUA and the other um, forms of unemployment insurance, right? So just because they're not on the typical state programs doesn't mean that unemployment is is, is all that much down from the peak. We peaked at a little over 32 million. We're still at 22 million. And if you go all the way back to the Great Recession, right? Great Re Recession numbers never got over about where about here. So all of that is excess, 14, 15 million extra people who are unemployed. And we have people falling out of the labor force now. So what has happened? Well, the temporary layoffs, as I mentioned in that article a few weeks ago, are becoming permanent and they're affecting higher income people. So as the temporary layoffs dropped 4 million, the permanent job losses rose 4 million. So this is the breakdown by industry. Remember back in January, I talked about um, how MBAs and kind of uh, your, your middle management was in big trouble because of artificial intelligence and just much more efficient ways of doing things. Well, there you go. Second biggest layoffs are among professional and business services. And this is getting to be even more pervasive. And most of these people won't get their jobs back. They're gonna have a hard time finding things. Unless you wanna be a salesperson and there's always room for salespeople. A lot of these folks have gotta change from thinking that they're management material because we just need less managers. We've known that a long time, but now we have the technology to, to get rid of the little fiefdom uh, supporters. Education and health services, falling off a cliff. Now, you wouldn't think that, right? But because we had hospitals that had to create capacity for COVID, and we have a lot of schools where the teachers are retiring and where the, the school systems can't support uh, the school systems, uh, we're losing a lot on the educational front as well. Now, you would think the government was paying more people, but no, cities and states around the country are starting to lay off cops and firefighters and other frontline people. Why? Because President Trump doesn't want to bail out Democratic cities. Now, that's kind of bullshit, again, uh, and in fact, it's a lot of bullshit, because the reality is that there's jobs being lost across the country, in particular the South which is you know, generally red. So this is not a Democrat Republican issue. This is the cities and states have been hit with a massive economic shock and they need federal help, the type of federal help that was designed to be given way back when the constitution was written. The constitution was written specifically with the ability of the federal government. This is, if you've, if you've never seen Hamilton, um, this is why the constitution was written the way it was why Hamilton designed the banking system the way that he did. We can help everybody if we want to. It's not a red and blue issue. Retail trade is down, so is wholesale trade, clearly just because there's less economic activity because people fear going out and doing things because of COVID-19. Manufacturing, everybody wants to talk about being up, but it's not, it's not. The companies are becoming more efficient, so they have fewer people employed and demand has drifted sideways now after the bounce off the bottom. Wholesale trade, 
So IT is doing okay, construction is doing okay, because people don't want to live in the middle of the city anymore, although that's kind of overstated. There's been a shortage of construction workers a long time. And weirdly, all this is doing is creating just a little bit of slack so that guys can hire people um, without them jumping job to job to job anymore. Transportation and warehousing, even as we've gone to an on-time delivery-based economy more and more, still not job, no job gains. So look at this, across the board, no job gains. So I know that some people hate this smart money, dumb money confidence index, but it's been very accurate over a long period of time. Smart money, your big investors, they're flowing out of the market and your little guys are pumping it up. Small trader call buying is still extremely high. It's pushing the market up. What happens when the call buying falls off? The recent balance sheet trends are that the Federal Reserve has in fact been pumping the uh, market a little bit into the election. At what point do you think this is no longer getting pumped up? They can't pump it forever, can they? So we have a big negative divergence in the market right now. There are more stocks in correction than normal, yet the stock market's still going up. So that means that breadth, which had expanded for a few weeks, suddenly has turned around. That is almost always a harbinger of a correction. See how it started to fall here, then peaked right there, right? So when this hits low numbers, you get a correction. Hits low number here, correction to follow. Low number here, correction to follow. So anywhere you see a low number, you know, and then here, he had the low numbers across the board, and we had that two-year sideways market happens over and over again. So these are a bunch of the indicators that I pull off of uh, Sentiment Trader. And what we're seeing is that there's all kinds of red signals right now. Insiders are buying some of the value stocks. So there are insiders who are buying particular stocks and we should probably keep an eye on that. But if you take a look at options activity, take a look at volatility, um, optics, excuse me, options and optics, pressure on the market you know, for margin, um, the oscillators, everything is starting to lean towards a reversal in the market. Again, we don't know how severe it will be. So let's get to our core topic today and let's review. Coronavirus is still raging, second wave, keeps the economy weak, stock market is getting jittery, overbought signals, your marginal demand is from the traders, which is hedge funds and small guys. And at some point, credit is going to tighten up. That's going to turn them in the other direction. How soon is that? Maybe as soon as two weeks from now. Um, I thought it would already be happening. Uh, we've gotten the jitterbugging, uh, but the Fed has kept dripping that money in there to keep it up. Just think about what if the Fed just went net neutral, net neutral. I think that at a minimum should be expected. But what happens if the Fed has to protect the dollar a little bit? And we've seen that recently. If the Fed has to protect the dollar a little bit, they have to do a little bit of tightening, if nothing else, to send a signal. And what if Biden wins? Um, I'm projecting them to win by 12 to 15 million votes. So, you know, I think it's going to happen. Um, and there's a blue wave, and which is what Wall Street's forecasting now. And we get three, four, five trillion dollars of economic stimulus next year. That would create money in motion. And that would mean that velocity of money ticks up. And then in certain areas, we'll get that inflationary pressure. Again, I think there's deflationary pressure through the first half of next year in certain other areas. And clearly, technology, AI in particular, has changed the nature of the workforce. Remember, we talked about this way back in January after the Consumer Electronics Show. I, I told you all this was coming. Coronavirus, again, it's just an accelerant. And it's an accelerant in the oil market too. So this is from BP. And there's a whole bunch of projections that look just like this. But BP is basically saying that, look, uh, oil demand's going to you know, tip over no matter what relatively soon. But in the rapid um, program for getting to net neutral carbon emissions, um, and then this would be a real, you know, real rapid, you're going to see oil demand turn down before the end of the decade. I believe that this orange line is the most likely. 
In fact, it really jives with the projection that I did back in March. So right now I'm on this orange path. That means that oil demand growth is basically over and we're gonna see it go sideways for a while. That, that peak oil demand plateau that I talked about, it's gonna turn over near the end of the decade, 2026, 7, 8, right in there. Why? Because the car company's already telling you that they're going EV and hybrid. At Ford's next earnings, which is in a couple of days, there's a very good possibility that the CEO comes out and says out loud, by 2025, we're going 100% hybrid and, and EV. Now, he's not going to say EV. He's going to say EV and hybrid because that way he doesn't use, lose his, his um, gasoline power demand people, right? So all the people with work trucks or they want a sports car or whatever, he'll make hybrids for them. Why wouldn't he do that for the work trucks? They're already telling you they're doing it for the work trucks. F-150 is going to be hybrid and then an EV already on the drawing board, already have release dates in 2022. So this is all coming and it's coming fast. And there's law reasons, there's legal reasons why it's going to happen by 2025. At 2025, the uh, mileage requirements are so high, uh, even with Trump watering them down and, and Biden will move them back, uh, maybe it'll take one extra year. There's not a technological way for gasoline engines to meet the mileage requirements. And this is one of the points that all the technology people and all the automobile executives at CES told us. They said, look, by 2025, we can't meet mileage requirements without going at least half EV and hybrid. So that means that the combined fleet has to be half EV basically. So they could go half EV and then half ice, or they could go a third EV and two thirds hybrid, right? Something along those lines. And that's what's coming. So that means that oil demand is just going to keep plunging, plunging. Now, since March, China has been stockpiling oil. And a year ago, I told you they're just going to build more capacity for storage, which is what they did. Satellite images show that there's a lot more storage tanks in China. And they're starting to unload the last barges of oil that they bought a couple of months ago at five, 10, $20 a barrel, right? They just bought it hand over fist. They bought basically every tanker in the world that they could. And what we have learned is that Iran is sending them oil through a pipeline and on ships that park themselves and then relabel themselves in Iraq's waters. And then they float over there without a transponder. We can follow them, right? There's, there's services out there that follow these, but they don't have a transponder. So nobody can really bust them. And Russia is protecting Iranian ships now. So even if we wanted to stop another Iranian ship, it would mean a confrontation with a Russian destroyer. And that's really the only way the price of oil goes up is if there's a war. We know that demand is falling. At around $42 per barrel, what we can see right here, right? This is right in between the red and green line. Oil is roughly at a balanced price. So right now, with current supply and demand, oil is at a balanced price. And we're still at record storage around the world, in particular in the United States and China, the two biggest users. India bought oil too. So Saudi Arabia is saying that the price of oil is going to get up to $50 next year. And they could be right, right? They're, they're the linchpin in oil in the whole world. Saudi Arabia is the most important company in a country and company in the world for oil price. So the average oil price, uh, this is where it's been. This is the median forecast for 2020. And this is the median forecast for 2021. Saudi Arabia is up here. So I would bet oil would be in this range next year. What does that mean? Well, the problem is that that means that North American shale still doesn't make any money. So this chart was updated yesterday by Rystad. And what you can see is that almost 40 million barrels a day are, are just from conventional wells, right? So that's 40% of demand. And then you have the onshore Middle East, and you take a look at what they have, and they say, huh, if they just pump, if they drill baby drill, right, they can really basically provide the next billion barrels. 
Okay, so let, let's think about that. A billion barrels. That means that they can produce all the oil in the world with nobody else producing for about the next four years. I believe that's right. Could be five or six years. I'd have to really put the pen to paper here because I'd have to subtract this out. Deep water suddenly just became cheaper. Why is that? Really two things. One, there's a deep water discovery off of Guyana and Tsunami, South America, that's turning out to be break-evens by, by at about $50 a barrel. Now, these are full cycle break-evens. What does that mean? Full cycle means uh, from beginning to the last production, 20 to 30 years out. On the front end, there's still expenses, which is why they're keeping the projects small. Exxon, Total, that's who's down there, Apache, Hess, there's a few others. So deep water is suddenly in the same price range as North American shale. That's a lot more competition, isn't it? And there's other oils out there that if you just take the bottom of their ranges and consider that those are going to produce, and Russia is going to produce, right? Russia is not going to stop producing. And, and the oil sands that are already operational, right, are pretty cheap. And this is actually a little bit wrong because the already producing oil sands are way down in the 20s. It's adding capacity for oil sands that's super expensive. So this is about break-evens on a full cycle. And maybe they have the already producing oil sands over here. I'd have to read the footnotes. But the point is, is that North American shale's not super competitive. It's not expensive, but it's not super competitive. And now we already know that they have to tighten up on their, even under Trump, uh, the EPA is telling them to tighten up on their methane capture. So that's going to add a couple dollars per barrel. And we're about to see the North Dakota access or the Dakota access pipeline maybe get shut down because it's going under a waterway. They just lost a major, major lawsuit. So there's a possibility that Dakota access pipeline, because again, stupid greedy pipeline and oil companies, instead of building a couple extra miles to go around things that are, you know, uh, sensitive, environmentally sensitive, they just go through it or under it or over it. They don't care what other people are saying. Well, now the, the courts are saying otherwise. So you're going to see Saudi Arabia and the rest of the Middle East drill baby drill for years. Why? Because they know this is coming. Why wouldn't they drill baby drill? And that means that we're going to see a lot of shale companies go out of business. So just to hammer in the point, if you go to oilprice.com, and if you've noticed, oilprice.com has gotten big into alternative energy. Oilprice.com, big into alternative energy. You see that the price of oil is low everywhere in the world. 40s and 30s, right? Canada stuck in the 30s. That's why they're not adding capacity because the new capacity for oil sands will never ever be profitable. So they're just going to use what's already there and take it while they can, which will be another five to 10 years um, because at that point it'll become more expensive to get it and they'll just say put trees on top of it. EIA cut their oil price forecast, World Bank 44, right? This all goes to those averages I showed you a second ago. The Balance has a good article about oil price forecasts, uh, very in line with um, some of the academic projections. Wall Street Journal, right? Bastion of capitalism and leaning libertarian. Oil recovery gonna dry, drag on beyond next year. Maybe I could say almost forever. Although there is a point where oil becomes more expensive, but it's it's years out. Some analysts are thinking it does get to around fifty dollars a barrel. The highest estimates are sixty dollars a barrel by the end of next year. I actually think that oil will get to sixty dollars a barrel, but not until twenty twenty two or twenty twenty three, and then it'll hold there for a while. And then when demand starts to fall, a few years later, the price of oil will drop again, most likely. But then as a lot of oil supply comes offline, remember I showed you just a moment ago, one moment please. As this oil does get used up, right, over the next decade, that means the more of this oil will get used. And remember, a lot of the deep water is already flowing. And the shale though, the shale, right, is, is short cycle. 
meaning that oil shale wells that were drilled two years ago are barely producing anymore. They're two year wonders. So could shale come back in the 2030s? It could on a limited scale consistent with whatever is happening here. So you could get your marginal um, demand could be just a little higher than marginal supply, even though both numbers are much lower than they are today. So let's take a look at XOP. And unfortunately, I don't know that I have Permian plays. Oh, here we go. So a year and a half ago, give or take, I wrote Permian play merger and takeover targets. This is where knowing your market and knowing your companies comes into play. I talked about these companies that all were probably takeover targets. Concho just got bought by Conoco. Parsley just got by, bought by Pioneer. In fact, I talked about it right here. I can see Pioneer acquiring Parsley. And that's exactly what happened a couple days ago. Centennial is going to get absorbed by somebody. And Diamondback, here's the problem with Diamondback. And this is the one that you should replace. Um, remember, I've, I've hedged on my idea of shorting Devon. Um, I think Devon is questionably uh, investable. I think it's more of a zombie. Uh, but I don't know that it's going to get beat up too much more anymore. Uh, because they also went through a merger, right? Devon Energy, we knew last year they were merger talks. We found out that it was uh, WPX, right? That's who they just merged with. No cash deal. None of these deals got a premium. In fact, none of these deals got any cash at all. Not a single check was written. And that's actually the focus of an article I am writing. What does that mean? What does it mean that all of these acquisitions were done without any cash at all? It was basically an absorption of debt and assets in exchange for shares. These were mergers. And the idea behind these mergers is to fire a lot of people control production, and figure out a way to pay that debt off over a long period of time. The issue is that until the price of oil gets to around 60, none of these companies are making money. So they can say our break even is 45, but again, let's take that with a grain of salt because the money that they put in is up front, and then they actually project out that last 20% of oil they're going to get over a very long period of time, right? The first 80% of the oil's first two years. So really they're looking at three, five, 10 year projections. And that's probably not real, real, that's not terribly realistic. So Diamondback Energy, here's the problem with Diamondback Energy. And this is a company that I think you can short instead of Devon if you want to have another short. The one thing that the market might decide is that because Biden's probably gonna win and we'll know in a couple of weeks, they might decide that the price of oil is going to go up because of Joe Biden. And they're probably right. He's going to tighten up the environmental real regulations and get rid of drilling on public lands. And they're not going to issue any more offshore permits. And it doesn't really matter. The whole offshore permit thing is kind of a silly argument because the Trump administration tried to sell permit after permit after permit, lease after lease after lease. And do you know what? The oil companies bought, get this, 6% of the leases that were available. 94% of the oil leases that the government offered over the last four years, there wasn't a single bidder, not a single bidder. So the change in offshore is not going to be all that dramatic. However, uh, about a third, 30% um, of the oil drilled uh, by frackers is on public land and they're not gonna be able to drill new wells. And so their existing wells, they go dry pretty quick, no new wells. So all those leaseholds are going to be rendered useless because they can't put a new hole in the ground. So what does that mean? Well, with the largest glut in history, we're going to see probably a slow uptick in demand. We'll get back to peak oil demand in a couple of years, hold it for a few years. And then by 2026, you've got all kinds of people driving EVs and hybrids. And why do I say it's going to happen that quick? Because next year, presuming Biden wins, there's going to be an incentive package to go out and buy a hybrid or an EV. You can right now go order a Ford Mustang Mach-E and get $7,500 off from the government. So your net cost on that EV, which is just as good as the Model Y from everything I can tell, I mean, split hairs in either direction, is $35,000. 
So would you buy an EV with 300 miles of range, all wheel drive if you want it, right? In Wisconsin, I gotta have that for 35 to $40,000. It's basically a big crossover, midsize crossover. Uh, we have a Volkswagen Tiguan as one of our cars. That's the one on lease that expires in a couple months. And that's as big as I need for city driving. Good for going shopping, things like that. So next year is going to be a big transition year for the economy in a lot of ways. First of all, um, if, if President Trump sneaks out and he wins his swing states by a vote and somehow remains president, um, I think the stagflation uh, depression scenario probably plays out because he clearly has no idea um, where the economy wants to head and he's fighting it. He's fighting the change to, to clean energy. Uh, he's fighting the whole uh, machine learning, uh, moving supply chains. I mean, he's been a beneficiary of the supply chains moving, and it has zero to do with his policies. His trade policies have been abysmal, and I'm writing about that as well. Uh, the Economist laid it out pretty well, and The Economist, you're right, that's a pretty libertarian-leaning thing too. So they're not, you know, some liberal mainstream medium. It's, it's, you know, it's like the Wall Street Journal. Um, so when the Wall Street Journal and mainstream media are warning you, excuse me, uh, the economists and are warning you uh, about Trump's economic policies, you damn well ought to take it seriously. Because I've been telling you about this since 2017 and almost everything I've said has come to pass about the economy. Missed an uptrade, you know, and stayed in oil too long. But the economic stuff has been spot on. And now the trades are all working again. So I would point out to you that oil stocks are probably a great hedge because even at $50 a barrel, they're not making money, right? You can, you can go ahead and short them. And that's what the cashless mergers tell you. The cashless mergers tell you that there's no value in these stocks. Most of these stocks should drop another 50% in price, if not more. And in particular, um, the companies that, uh, on here that don't have the ability to really get bought by anybody and nobody's going to buy them. I mean, who's going to buy continental resources? There are two drilling places. One's going dry and the other one has earthquakes and they got a massive amount of debt. Oil demand's turning over. These guys have almost $6 billion of debt. They're losing money. They've got $2 billion of liquidity left. They have two years to figure it out at Diamondback Energy. And the prices aren't going to be high enough for them to do that. They have to get bought in what I would call a take under. Nobody's going to buy them at the price they're at right now, which is a valuation of about $5 billion. $5 billion, that means enterprise value is around $11 billion. This company's not worth $11 billion. To who? They have second best rock, right? Their, their assets are not as good as Parsley or Concho. Go ahead and Google that. Everybody says the same thing. But I showed the maps. They have second best assets. Conoco or Chevron might go after them, uh, but not at $11 billion a total price. So you take, this is a list of the companies in XOP, which is where we're going to end. XOP is the Spider um, Oil and Gas EMP ETF. So this one won't be there, right? This one just got bought. EQT is about to buy another uh, gas producer. And there's a problem with natural gas too. So the latest breakthrough in solar is that they can probably double the efficiency of solar, which means cut the price in half. Solar is already competitive with natural gas. What happens if the price of solar goes down 30, 40, 50% again? And it's going to. In the next two, three, four years, that is what is going to happen. And all the gas producers know it and all the investors know it. That's why there's a massive, massive divestiture going on of these assets. The shift is on, right, to sustainable investing. So the idea that natural gas is a good investment is wrong. The pipelines, the gas pipelines are the only thing that have any value in fossil fuels anymore. The only thing. Now, if you wanted to speculate and do a pair trade, Pioneer Natural Resources is probably the only oil company in America that I would invest in. 
internationally, I would like look at Total. So if you wanted to be long, some of the, what you thought the winners would be, Total and Pioneer at the top of the list. Pioneer as an independent, Total as a major. Conoco is probably a zombie, but they'll never die. Devon Energy, I think, is 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 safely in zombie land, right? Never gonna have a productive life, but probably not gonna die, right? Because they bought WPX. Um, but you go through these gas companies and they have so much debt that they're going to produce natural gas for the next 20, 30 years. And even though the price will tick up because there will be pressure uh, from the government, uh, the reality is that over the next 10 years, you're going to see penetration of solar and batteries skyrocket. Because this latest technology change in solar, which is, I mean, it was, I found it in oil price, uh, dot com is massive. And then what we have learned recently, Chinese figured this one out, is that you can take plastic, hit it with a microwave and create um, a residual product and, and capture 97% of the hydrogen. Why is that important? Because we are finding ways to turn hydrogen into energy. And it may not work in a, in a car, but in a heavy vehicle, again, CES, this is what they're talking about. Hydrogen is uniquely positioned for heavy vehicles, ships, trains, big, big trucks. Although I think most big trucks will be EV. And the more I look at that, the more I think it'll be EV. Because on the tractor trailers, why wouldn't you just put a big row of solar across the top? And so when they're parked or even driving, they're getting a slow charge. You know, they'll still have to stop every eight to 10 hours, which by law they're supposed to anyway. It's all going to work out. So demand for oil is going to plunge. That means there will be less residual natural gas production. That'll drive the price of natural gas up, but that'll drive demand for natural gas down. There's, it's a no-win situation because the substitution effect is major now, major, and accelerating, not decelerating. Even if Trump wins, it'll accelerate. It'll just accelerate a little slower for a while. So if you want to bet against something, I think that there's one last leg down on XOP. And the reason why it won't be a bigger leg down is because a lot of the companies are getting merged out of existence, right? So you don't have those drags. As the last um, bankruptcies and mergers occur over the next four, five, six months, by next year, this won't be a good short. You know, maybe it'll even be down to, to, to 15 or 20. But from where it is now in the, in the low 40s, I think it's 44 or 45 right now, I think getting down to about 30, which is where it got to recently, is probable. So if you want to hedge, you can hedge this. But more importantly, I just want to tell all you folks who keep asking me about oil stocks and gas stocks, cut it out. They're shit. They're going to be shit forever. They're never going to get better, ever. The LNG stocks are in trouble too. Why? Because the rest of the world is going to use less of it. A few years ago, I said that they need to stop building natural gas export facilities because they're not going to be used. And that actually happened. There's really nothing coming online, probably ever again. I think there's one. So will there be liquefied natural gas ex uh, uh, exports? Yeah, but it's probably not going to increase anymore, especially since Qatar in the Middle East is better at it than we are. And Iran's better at it than we are. These are the winners for the last leg of oil and gas. This is how the Middle East is going to stay out of warfare, hopefully. Or at least this is their last chance to rebuild those societies, to be honest with you. Over the next 10 to 20 years, if the Middle East doesn't rebuild their societies using this last burst of wealth and reinvest in, in diversifying their economies, they're screwed. You will see genocides in the Middle East like you've never seen before, and we've seen some doozies by the 2030s and 2040s, if they don't make use of this money. And part of American and European and Japanese policy will be to let them make that money. Why? Because policy has always been, give people a little bit of wealth and a little bit of hope, and they're much less likely to fight with you. So anybody who wants to talk about America first, our oil, our natural gas, our fracking, you need, you need to get off it because you don't understand what's going on. You don't understand how peace is kept, and you don't understand how technology works. And the jobs 
in the oil and gas sector are already going away and they've been going away for a decade, especially since 2015. I guess since 2015, job increased through 2015 with the start of the fracking boom. So fracking has had a pivotal role in American en energy independence. Back in 2012 on MarketWatch, I said that fracking was gonna cause major tectonic shifts uh, in geopolitics, basically that we'd get out of the Middle East, which we are largely doing, and America would essentially be energy independent. America doesn't need to produce 13, 14, 15 million barrels a day of oil to be energy independent. We just have to, at the margins, have a viable industry that can ramp it up, and these are short cycle projects, so it's very easy to do. If the price of oil ever does spike over 60-ish, and remember, I always thought it would be around 80, but I think the I think the realistic price for oil is about 60 a few years out and then being in that range for a long time. But, but fracking had a role and it still has a role in the transition to cleaner energy. That transition is going to be a lot faster now with or without Biden winning. I mean, that, that'll only impact things by a couple of years if he loses, but he will um, accelerate things by a few years if he wins. And I think that the market will reflect that pretty quickly. In fact, I think the market already is reflecting it. So finding value in energy, whether it's alternative or oil and gas, oil and gas is almost impossible. Um, I, I don't even know that you call pioneer value. I just think that they die a slower death. I don't know the stock ever goes up again. I think the best that you can hope for oil stocks is that some of them chop sideways and the zombies die slowly and everybody else goes bankrupt. So I would be remiss to not tell you, sell all your oil stocks again. And if you want to short some, I think you can short continental resources. I think you can short Occidental. And I think you can short um, Diamondback, maybe. But I think the easy ones are Occidental and Continental. So why bother with the others? And then XOP, at least for several months, I think you can short it down to about 30. Again, these are to offset your long positions and other things, because we know that the market's, you know, choppy right now. And we know that the Fed can't print forever. And we know that speculative activity never ends well, not for the, not for the most people. So if smart rich guys are telling you be cautious, but the small aggressive guys are telling you to pile in, who do you want to listen to? Has it been a mistrade for a little while? Sure, but I'll leave you with this. Don't ever make a bad trade to make up for a missed trade. I'll take some questions off uh, air.